Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you seek us. We thank you that you hear our prayers, and we thank you, Lord, that you are able to answer those prayers. May our eyes be open to see your hand at work about us, our ears be open to hear your word, our hearts be open to receive and embrace it. Come, Holy Spirit, take over the service. Fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to see you in the house of the Lord today where we do worship our Lord and Savior, the risen King Jesus. And he is glad that you are here in his house today. I found a quote. It was actually written by Napoleon Bonaparte. And it goes like this. And I think it's very apropos for what our topic is today with the centurion and Jesus. He said this. Alexander, Caesar, and Hannibal conquered the world, but they had no friends. Jesus founded an empire upon love, and as of this hour, millions would die for him. He has won the hearts of men, a task a conqueror cannot do. He has won the hearts of men, a task a conqueror could not do. You see, when I look at those names, Alexander and Caesar and Hannibal, they were great commanders. They commanded great armies. They came through and they took over lands. They captured and they settled those lands. But just because they come in and conquer doesn't mean that people are going to love them and follow them. They had the task of a ruler. That Some of them were very strong taskmasters. And so they weren't received as well. Those who followed probably followed out of fear of retribution. Not out of fear of their greatness, but out of fear of retribution. It sets a stage for what we have read today in our gospel. It sets a stage because we are talking about a man who is of great authority. The centurion. He's called a centurion because he has power over at least a hundred men. Power and authority to push or to incorporate or to see that the laws of Rome are being applied and followed. So the, the city of Capernaum is up on the northern area of the Lake of Galilee, sea of Galilee or the Lake of Tiberias, however they want to refer to it. It's a huge city. It is one where the trade routes went through. There were a great number of docks where the fishermen could go out and fish in the Sea of Galilee and bring their fish in there to sell at the market. We know that it's the home of Peter and his family. It's where they started from. It's a huge port. And so Rome looked at this as a great place of revenue. So not only was the centurion there with all of his people and all the men that he was in charge of to keep the peace, he was also there to collect the taxes and to make sure that people paid the tolls. It's like when you drive to Orlando. We pay the tolls as we go through. Do you realize that that all comes all the way back to the Romans? So we can thank the Romans for that. (laughs) We pay the tolls as we go through. But that's what he was there for. He was there to make sure that there was peace in the territory, that the the dissenters were not going to rise up, and if they did, that he would squash them. He was a man of great authority and power. Not only that, but he was paid more than a normal soldier. He probably made anywhere from 50 to 100 times more than a regular soldier would. He was given a lot from the government. He was given a great responsibility. He was a person that you would look to and say, wow, you know, he's a general basically in in many ways. But here he is, and he has this servant, this slave. And the interesting thing is that he was very fond of this slave. He took very good care of this person. He had a great compassion for this person. When this 
slave became sick. He had heard of Jesus, and so he sought him. A man of authority who could command Jesus to come goes to him. And the other thing that we really have to look at, and maybe it's not apparent right up front, but he's a Gentile. He is one who the Jewish people would despise because he is a Gentile. He's one that is outside, but yet they like him. One, we know too that he's a God-fearer. He worships the one true and living God of Israel. The revelation had come to him that he is the one true and living God, not the other gods. Gentiles had many other gods. They could worship many other gods. They could go and worship, you know, different spirits and things like that and call upon them. You know, the Romans always talk about Zeus and all the other gods that were there, or Jupiter. But he came to the realization that there's one true and living God. He came to the point of the heart of the Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And this is where he believed. He believed so much that whether he actually built it and financed it, talking about the synagogue, or whether he contributed a great amount so that the synagogue could be built. Either way, here's a Gentile who is contributing. A Gentile who could not go into the synagogue but would have to worship on the outskirts of it. A God, Gentile who feared God, not out of retribution, but out of reverence for the great power that he had. He realized who God was, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Psalm 96 that we read this morning references that. And he says, For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. This is what the centurion realized. He would not be unaware of what Jesus' ministry was. Jesus had been preaching in the area. Jesus had been doing miracles in the area. And, and there's an account in Luke right before this in which there was a man who had demonic oppression and Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. He did many miracles in that area. And so when the centurion hears about this, he calls on Jesus. He calls the elders of the church. He didn't feel he was even worthy enough to come before Jesus. But he sent the elders, the ones that were Jewish, to go to Jesus. And amazingly, they say, he is worthy to receive this. He loves and respects us. He's part of us. Lord, he deserves to have his servant healed. The other side of this is if we look at Jesus' willingness to go. You see, if a Jewish person went into a Gentile's house, they were declared unclean. They would have to go through a ritual of cleansing. And yet, Jesus is willing to come. Jesus is willing to come to him and come to his house. And it's along the way that we hear the second part of this discourse in which the centurion says, you do not need to come. I'm not even worthy to come to you and you do not need to come into my house. And just say the word. He, what he recognized was Jesus' authority. He recognized Jesus' power. He recognized who he was. And he didn't have any doubts about what Jesus could do. He says, I am unworthy to even have you underneath my roof. A man who has great authority, military authority, who has great power in the area, and this lone rabbi, he says, I'm not even worthy of you. A Jew, I'm not even worthy of you. Because he saw who Jesus was. He recognized who Jesus was. And he knew the power that Jesus had. The centurion has 
this kind of faith. And his prayer wasn't that, Oh Lord, if only. Oh Lord, if you could. How many of y'all pray like that? Come on, you can be honest. My eight o'clockers were nodding their heads like this. You know, they're more Baptist than you are today. Even though we had Rock of Ages for our entrance, you know, I'm trying to get you in the mood here. But we do sometimes. Well, Lord, you know, if it's possible. What does Scripture say? All things are possible to, you know, God. Oh, Lord, if only. Oh, well. Or we have this one. Lord, you really are God. You would, and then you fill in the blank, right? Lord, if you really are, give me the lottery numbers and think about what I can do for your kingdom. (laughs) It's true, we do that. We try to negotiate. We try to bargain with God all the time. We like to say those prayers. If only, if... It's not an out. The centurion didn't have an out. Well, Jesus, if you could, you would. It wasn't a manipulation of it. It was, I have faith that you will or you can. You just say the word and it's done. He had no doubts about what Jesus could do. He had no doubts about his power and authority. He said, you say the word and I'll do it. And Jesus is taken back by this. There's only two times in scripture that says he was amazed or astonished. Because what happened was, he said, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. I want to go back to when Jesus went to his hometown. He's been baptized, he's been preaching through the area, he's been performing miracles, and he goes back to his hometown. And it's kind of like, Jesus, you know, Son of God, comes back, returns. You know, there weren't flyers going around that says, hey, Jesus is coming for a tent revival. But he came and he preached in the synagogue and he read from the scriptures of Isaiah and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled. And it's at this point that the Pharisees that were there, the rabbis that were there, said, who is he? Isn't he the son of Mary? Isn't he the carpenter's kid? Isn't he the brother of Simone and the others? Who is he? And Mark reminds us in his gospel that he could do very few miracles there because they didn't believe. Here is a Gentile who has greater faith than those in the city of Nazareth. A Gentile who trusts that Jesus can and will and the others who said, Ah, we don't receive him. Oh, he's just the carpenter's kid. Oh, he's just the son of Mary. He's not who we want him to be. They rejected him. The faith that they should have had, they rejected. I think that's true in a lot of the things that we see in our lives and around the people around us. We want God in a box. We want him somewhere here. We want him... We figure out how God should be. Not who he is, but who we want him to be. We are not willing to put our trust and faith totally into Jesus as the Son of God, as the centurion. It's easier not to than to do it. It's easier to trust in ourselves and take control like a centurion could over his people rather than saying, Lord, you are. And you just say the word and I'll do. It's part of our structure sometimes that we reject rather than receive. And our gospel today is really about no matter what authority we think we have in our lives, the greatest authority is through Christ. The greatest authority is through the Son of God. And He, He alone is the one. He alone is the one. The Word is getting out to the foreigners. In our reading in Kings this morning, It really is about the story of the dedication of the temple. God had given David the promise 
that there would be a temple. He wouldn't build it, but he would be. There would be a temple. His son Solomon would build it. And it was built in great glory. And they were all gathered around. This was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was going to be laid. The housing, the dwelling place of God. God was coming to reside with them in the temple. And it's a story and tells us about the worship of God. Because it was unlikely that they would ever do something like this. This little tiny nation of Israel. The one that's of the least power. And yet God has lifted them up to conquer all the nations around them. And part of our reading this morning, and I just want to refer to you because it's important. It wasn't just about the Jewish people. They were there to show the world who God was and the power that he had. And Solomon prays this. He says, Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of our pe your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when he comes and prays towards this house. Hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. Not a fear of retribution, a fear of reverence for the power of God. The fear that, of the presence of His power and what He can do. And this is what the centurion has done. And this is what we are called to do. As Christians, we are called to reach out to follow God. The effectiveness of our prayers are because that we have that faith and trust not in ourselves, but in Him. That we would follow Him and Him alone. Our effectiveness of our prayers is that we trust that God is willing to do for us what He desires and seeks for our best and for our betterment. It's not about us limiting, but it's about opening. It's not about us closing a door, but it's about us opening the door to allow God to come in and work in our lives. Not everything is going to be rosy, but the thing is we know that God will walk with us and through it. But we have to have that prayer of faith and trust in Him. The centurion gives us that kind of example of having faith. That example of how our faith can be. Just say the word, Lord, and I know it will occur. Are we like that centurion? Do we say, just Lord, I put all my trust in you. I put my trust in you today. I put the lives of those that I love in your hands. I put the, my life in your hands and I trust you and I'll follow you. I think... Today's gospel is a great representation of how we can worship and follow God. By giving ourselves, by saying, I'm unworthy, Lord, you're worthy. Whatever you say will happen, will happen. And let us place our trust in Him. And let us follow Him. Amen.